In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking with Professor Kevin Anderson from the Universities of Manchester and Uppsala. We discuss the irreconcilable narratives that are dominating the top-down discourse on how we respond to man-made climate breakdown. Instead of making the space for envisioning a better world, perpetrators of the status quo instead construct fantasies as a way to deflect criticism and delay real action. Thank you to all subscribers for supporting this series. There are many more episodes in the pipeline as we continue in our efforts to articulate these complex and existential problems. Thanks. All the indicators are telling us that we have to change course to address climate change. The IPCC has calculated that the world must reduce emissions by at least 43% over the next seven years in order for us to keep 1.5 within reach. That is our North Star. It is in fact our only destination. It is simply acknowledging and respecting the science. We need a system-wide holistic transformation of entire economies. Economies that currently run on the equivalent of 250 million barrels of oil, gas, and coal every single day. These are barrels that need to be either replaced or decarbonized to create a proper, yet responsible, pro-climate, pro-growth future. Kevin, it's very good to see you. And you too, Nick. Many countries proudly call themselves leaders on tackling climate change. The, the UK, the US is always doing it, Canada and Norway, etc. And yet most are ruthlessly expanding fossil fuel production at a time when we're told that it locks in climate breakdown. With a state-owned oil company CEO as president of COP28, how would you characterize this moment now following three decades of these COPs? I think the the fossil fuel industry and the broader high energy use industries around it have now completely succeeded in co-opting the COP process or processes. That we've got to a point where this year, despite what the science is telling us, despite the fact that we are seeing a significant increase, both in uh, empirically invisible impacts, but also in terms of the response of much of civil society or many within civil society, to the challenges that we're facing on climate change. Set against all of that, what we've got is a COP process that has been completely taken over by the fossil fuel um, companies and associated organizations. So in, in, in their eyes, this is, this is ultimate success. And the real success is we're still calling it a COP process. We're still claiming that it has some relevance to the issue of climate change this is not about climate change anymore it's about the incumbents maintaining power and they have been phenomenally successful throughout the cop processes in driving it in their direction and this year i think epitomizes just just how successful that has actually been set against as i said the science and the response of some into civil society civil society to the to the challenges that we're facing Based on what you said, I mean, it presents a good argument for just turning your back on the whole process and walking away. But the most vulnerable nations are typically much poorer and they rely on this process because it is the only place where they sit at the table and to a degree their voice is heard. So I don't think we can just turn our back on the process. Al Gore and Christiana Figueres both recently said we need to get the lobbyists out and in fact, you know, the UAE is a very good example of how fossil fuel executives and political leaders are so tightly knit together. Do you think this is the big step we need to take? Oh, absolutely. And well, in the COP processes, that won't in itself get us anywhere near to living on our Paris agreements. But at the moment, they are completely thwarting any serious action to, to respond to climate change. So uh, it, it is a, a prerequisite that we remove the lobbyists from these negotiations, not just these negotiations, other major ne climate negotiations that go on throughout the year. So we can't just focus just, just on this single sort of 
uh, once a year COP process, COP, grand COP event. Nevertheless, they have to re- be removed from from what we're going to see in, in, in end of November and beginning of December. That's not going to happen this year. So that will be another year where the fossil fuel majors will be significantly influencing the debate. By the time we get to the COP next year, that will be another 40 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. You know, it's a significant proportion of our, um, of our, we're well over 10% of our remaining 50 50 chance of 1.5 degrees C carbon budget. And so the failure this year, which is locked in, will have impacts on the climate. But yes, I can understand that particularly the poorer parts of the world feeling this is a forum where they can get their voices heard. And indeed, they have had their voices heard in the past. But I think we also have to recognize that, that without removing the lobbyists, the power and the voices from those poorer communities will be um, overshadowed repeatedly by the, the interests of the self-interest of the wealthy countries. You talked a minute ago about those of us who follow the science. And funnily enough, Al Jabir, the, the CEO and president of the next COP, recently said, you know, we are following the science. For those of us outside the COP and, you know, there's the activists, there's a growing number of people in society who are truly understanding now what the science is telling us. Is this a moment, do you think, where we acknowledge the ridiculousness of the current COP status quo? And we start to rethink the future, even if it's like a day by day, week by week, and we look at the alternatives and see how we can reconstruct where we're headed. It has come to something when this year we're seeing a major oil producer now overseeing the COP process, not only overseeing it, but in their statements. But their statements, of course, are just similar ones to being said by many ministers in in the US, the UK and elsewhere, where we need more oil to help us have less oil. We've got to a position where it, it is completely Orwellian, <laughs> the structures that we now have and the norms and narratives that we have, that we can actually have people seriously stand up with a with a serious face reported by journalists that we need more oil to help us have less oil. That, that's the situation we've come to. We've completely normalized this you know, totally bizarre set of narratives and storyline. And there is a real role here, not just for civil society, but actually for the journalists to start to be report to report more honestly, to do their job properly. And I think the journalists, with with notable exceptions, but the journalist community has broadly failed to seriously address the climate change challenges and report on it appropriately to to society. And without the journalists, then I think society can easily be misinformed about where we are, the challenges we face, the powers that do not want to see um, changes in our society, and and so I think there is there is a the journalists are a key a key player in this, along with civil society maintaining its nerve at a time when when the powers opposing changes on climate change. Um, are, are even more in charge of the of the formal processes than they have been throughout the past thirty years of of ongoing failure. And you mentioned the journalists, and especially in the sort of major countries that we're talking about, there's been a, a sort of sil- radio silence on these issues for probably a decade or so. And in a way, it feels that that hoodwinks the middle classes who are generally wealthier in society to into a false sense of security and do you think that that false sense of security is now starting to sort of evaporate because people are seeing what's going on and it's become Mm. that sort of who do you believe me or your eyes kind of thing and it you know people are starting to ask hang on this doesn't look good (laughs) our crops are failing there's floods every single day and heat waves every single day somewhere i think there is something in that that the debate around issues of climate change is not just amongst um an exclusive few in the in the climate realm the experts and now increasingly people within formal and informal civil society groups but beyond that i think there's a much wider discussion on issues of climate change the polling data i think you have to take the polling data often with a bit of a well you have to have to be a discerning user of it i won't say a pinch of salt but um 
I think if you use it with some discernment, then it can be useful. But polling data typically shows that there's greater concern amongst the public, amongst the middle classes for these issues. As you say, you, we can see some of the impacts around us. Um, and, and, and indeed, some of us are being impacted by uh, by climate change to, more directly as well as indirectly. I also think we can see how stupid and ridiculous the process is when we see an oil shake standing up and saying, we're really concerned about climate change. We follow the science, but we need more oil to help us get less oil. But, you know, the, the people aren't stupid. They can see how ludicrous that situation is. And so I suppose many of the ducks are lined up for m much greater civil society engagement in these issues, which hopefully then can put some pressure on a political process that has broadly been behind the companies, particularly the fossil fuel majors, than it has been behind the populations that have put them in, in power, particularly in democracies. Maybe this has been naive and too, too hopeful, but I think there is potential for some significant change to come about as a combination of a whole set of factors. But let's not ever underplay the power of the incumbents to control the narrative. And they now include the journalists or senior journalists and the editors and the media barons. And so we can't rest on our laurels here. We will only have success if we start to speak out much more vociferously. And we are seeing that in society, but that engagement needs to go much further, and much wider. But before, when I was saying about uh, rethinking the way forward, and I was really referring to a lot of thoughts coming out of the people I've interviewed, they're not from this status quo um group if you like but i think it's it's so obvious that the rishi sunak type characters are not going to be the the leaders who are going to transform society as the science quite clearly states we need to you have often referred in the past to the sort of velvet revolution is our best our sort of best hoped course have you given thought to how that might play out. I have, and I have ongoing discussions and disagreements with one of my colleagues that I work very closely with. Um, we have we have some views that we we certainly share, but other ones he, he's certainly, and I think appropriately, very cautious about the velvet, velvet revolution being an appropriate metaphor for the changes that, that that are necessary. Like all metaphors, I would argue that they 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 just illustrative. That's all they are. They're sort of heuristics, learning tools, and they're, they're not the real thing. Nothing like it. But I think they can provide us some pointers in the right direction, perhaps. Let's focus in on the UK. And indeed, I think I could say the EU, because it's an area where I know more about. The, the levels of leadership that we've had are having at the moment. Th these people will not be able to address the climate challenge. They are ill-equipped. At best, they're somewhere about 1970 to 1980. They're reductionists. They're also deeply elite in their view of society. But they have none of what is necessary to understand the challenges we face, let alone then put in, put in place the necessary responses. So we will fail if we continue with that inappropriate yesteryear leadership. We are failing with them. Do they have to be the people that drive this process? No, they don't. Of course, they can, in democracies, they can be changed. But are they changed for someone else who's just, a, just a, you know very similar, just a different hue? really, a different shade, that's all? Um, or can there be change for someone who genuinely is more interested in the prosperity of the citizens of their society or the well-being of those people that run the fossil fuel companies and the other major players who are reluctant to, to see the necessary levels of social and technical change that we, that we need to address the climate challenge? How do we bring about that change? I don't think we know until afterwards, no doubt clever people afterwards will say, oh, I saw how we had to do that. But actually, I think all we can really say is that we have to play our role as best that we can. And we don't know exactly what that role is, but it's one of honesty, integrity, of standing up, of not being held back by what the establishment is telling us, not being held back by co-opted journalists and indeed often academics. So it needs courage. It needs some sort of levels of collectivism. Even if we don't necessarily agree with each other, we should be we should be supporting other to, each other to, to to stand up and and be counted and to have the courage to of our own convictions. I think we're starting to see some of that. 
And I think that could well play into a change, either a, either an active change of leadership, whereby the, the current incumbents are replaced by people who are equipped for the job and have some moral thread that runs through them, which a lot of the current leaders do not have, and certainly not courageous, it could be replaced, or perhaps some of the ones in power. And we can't always think that it's easy, again, with the UK um, to think of just the senior ministers. But often often that process of them getting there means that they are the least ill-equipped people to be proper ministers. And the other, the other backbenchers, the other MPs across the parties, there are some very good people there who want to see progressive change in our society across the parties. And perhaps lending support to those voices is really important. So do not tar all policymakers, all politicians with the same brush. There are there are very there are there are big differences within parties and across parties. So I think we can work to some degree with the system, but the current incumbents that are leading it, I think are simply ill-equipped for the challenges that we face. In some ways, this takes us back to this thing about the lobbyists, because mm -hmm. removing them from the COP process and also from national politics, you know, the po political decision-making would create a void that perhaps would let in those new voices and, and trigger some of those different connections or conversations. From all of the data we see in somewhere like the UK, and again, I'm sure this is the case for most of the, of the other major industrialised nations, the door is revolving for the oil majors, for the heads of the airline companies and so forth, but it's not there. It's not revolving. I mean, occasionally someone from some of the other sort of renewables or NGOs and so forth are let in, but basically the voice that they hear all the time is, is that of the fossil fuel majors and their acolytes. So I think you have to remove those from the thinking within government. And that, again, requires politicians with a spine. And we, we don't have those. The ones that we have are locked into the status quo. So yes, those those lobbyists need to be moved, moved out of this process. But let's also be clear that these lobbyists are not just what we see going backwards and forwards through the swinging door. They're, they're much more entrenched in the system. So you'll find government departments whereby some of the people working there will be seconded from the oil companies who very kindly are paying their salaries for these people to work in government ministries one way or another. Yeah, they're not doing that neutrally. They're not doing it altruistically. They're doing it because they know that they can undermine the process of change. And whilst the oil majors are fully aware of the climate science, as we've seen repeatedly, I mean, they've, they've lied about what they've known for years. They are on top of the climate science. What they are trying to do now is to claim that they, they appreciate the climate science, they understand the climate science, they, they realize how important it is, but what they're really trying to do, of course, is delay legislation that's going to require us to stop burning fossil fuels. And they're doing that at every turn that they possibly can. So don't just think by stopping the physical lobbyists going backwards and forwards that that, that will be enough. The tendrils of these oil majors are in every facet of, of life. You know, the advertising in sport, the in the arts the running of organizations, the sponsoring of all sorts of events, as well as paying for some of our policymakers indeed. And indeed, recently I heard on Radio 4 that one of the senior presenters of the major news program actually speaks at um, oil events and gets paid to speak at oil events and then does interviews on climate change and other associated issues. So at, at every level of society, the oil majors have their tendrils fused into those it's not just about the overt lobbying. That really does come back to this idea of a revolution in a way, because you have to you have to gut the system so much that the politicians with spine generally don't get to the top because they're not sycophantic enough or whatever the, the requisite skills are to, to get up to the top. And it it seems like we're not we're not really geared up for that anywhere at the moment. I mean, history is littered with times when policymakers have stood up to be counted. But they haven't done it in isolation. They've done it when there's there's a whole set of other voices around them that, that have driven that. So we, you know, the policies that we have on, and I mean, I'm not saying that these things are being resolved, but certainly the policies we have on race, on gender, on universal suffrage and voting and so forth, uh, and on many other aspects as well. I mean, the, we have environmental legislation, we have lots of other social legislation as well. These things have been put in place over time, ultimately by the policymakers, but they haven't done that in a vacuum. And sometimes they've been very reluctant to do that, but they've been required, forced by by pressures within society to do the right thing.
And so let's not give up on the political process, but let's not also rely on the political process. That's why this this idea of the revel, velvet revolution, it's not something that is top down. It very much has strong elements of bottom up as well. And I know I, I use this language quite regularly, but and I know it's not some people don't like it particularly, but I still I very much see it like this, that there is this very messy and emergent partnership between bottom up and top down. And that ultimately change comes out of that messy partnership in one way or another. And so there's a role there for wider groups of citizens to come together to try and drive that process, to provide guidance, examples of what is necessary, to lobby with evidence, I think is what's important here. You're not lobbying on the basis of just self-interest, which is what I think the oil majors and so forth are doing. You're, you're lobbying here with interests for, for the well-being of society today and in, indeed in the future. So there's a really important role for society to do that. But then there's also an equally important role for leaders with integrity to, to listen to those voices and start to say, how do we put policies in place that can bring about the rapid changes that are necessary? To, just to reiterate how rapid these changes need to be, we are on the point of failing at even the weak end of the Paris Agreement, you know, the, the well below two degrees centigrade, which now the science is, I think from the, from the science is fairly clear that, that if we go towards two, we are really at risk of some very, very severe impacts. I and mean, we're seeing impacts occurring at, at 1.2 degrees centigrade, roughly where we are today. And we know that inter- impacts get considerably worse as the temperature gets higher and higher. But if you look at what carbon budget that we have left, the amount of carbon dioxide that we can emit if we get to stay below, say, 2 degrees centigrade, it's, it's so little. The implications of that for countries like the UK mean we have to change our, our way of doing things over the next one, two, three years. If we don't start to make those rapid changes, then we simply will not be in a position whereby we can drive emissions down fast enough to stay within the carbon budgets. So the the implication of this, I think, is is really important. We have an election coming up. Now, unfortunately, I think at the moment, the most likely two main parties in it are singing a very similar song, some slightly adjusted verses. But broadly, it's a very similar tale of growth, steadying the ship, business as usual, and a mixture of growth and future technologies will somehow respond to the climate agenda. I mean, that is just lies and nonsense. But that is true from both of our main political parties at the moment. That doesn't mean to say that all the people in the parties agree with that, but certainly at the leadership level, it's just about who can manage that decline most successfully. Given what you've just said about the the carbon budgets and uh, the level of impacts we're getting now and where we're actually going, I mean... Two degrees, I mean, a lot of the people I've been speaking to, it is now these back-to-back years of impacts, which are really just decimating ecological systems, which are actually underpin everything. And a lot of people are starting to starting to realise this and are panicking. And there's a report coming yeah. out next week on risk tipping points that the UN University are putting out. And they're citing biodiversity loss, water collapse for crops and collapse of the insurance industry these and these are much more integrated tipping points Mm. within within our earth system do you think it's going to be shocks like those that create the sort of space for the so-called velvet revolution yeah it's interesting this because um as you're speaking then i'm also thinking about the uh, discussion i had recently with johan rockstrom which is videoed and and available for people to listen to and johan is well versed in these sort of system level integrated challenges these planetary boundaries as he refers to them and the the tipping elements and tipping points these sorts of combined sets of impacts which make the situation much much more dire than simply looking at carbon emissions and carbon budgets so when you put those other things there the situation looks far worse because the resilience of the system on which we have relied for the last few billion years is being deeply eroded in literally just just a handful of decades by by contemporary society and so they've been eroded so those 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 elements of resilience that are embedded in nature if you like and the dynamics of nature we have undermined those and we continue to undermine them which which makes the situation look much worse yet at the same time in the interview with you, and other people can make their own judgment on this, and I'm trying not to be unfair of his position. I, I feel he is he demonstrates the level of deep cognitive dissonance that actually a lot of experts have here. So he is, you know, and I completely believe him. He's deeply concerned about the situation that we're in today, 
And I think he understands and recognizes that better than most people, actually, because that's the realm he works in. Yet at the same time, he makes the point in that interview that we can't drive massive social political change. So therefore, he's deeply reliant on future technologies to resolve the challenges that we face today. And those positions, I would argue, are incompatible. And But that is very common, I think, amongst the expert class, that we can imagine future technologies. Often these people aren't particularly adept technically. I mean, they're not that astute and understand how engineering and technology work. It's a very different thing to science. Yet they evoke technologies because they have made a judgment call about an area of which they have no more expertise than anyone else, that we cannot drive rapid, deep political change. And so I think there's a real issue here that the expert community is actually probably ill-equipped to understand the implications of what their own expertise actually suggests is necessary. So we look at the sort of work from Johan and, and lots of other people on these systemic levels of challenges that are coming together at the same time, this sort of perfect storm to some degree. And yet they still can't see that that is going to require some major political, social upheaval, as well as technical change, if we're to respond to them. They're still hanging on to the hope that we can deal with this purely through technical adjustments to business as usual. That was a fascinating conversation. I will link to it. In that, there was a point where you didn't mention the negative emissions technologies, which I think you're referencing, which are embedded in these integrated assessment models, which they've been used to guide policy. Can you unpick a little bit your main concern with that? In all of the scenarios, all of the high level scenarios, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so working, what's called Working Group 3 of the IPCC, all of their scenarios, and indeed really all of them all of the major global high level scenarios. And these are, you know, um, scenarios about the future in terms of, usually in terms of energy and emissions. They all rely on some form of carbon dioxide removal. And we, these terms now chip off our tongue as if they're perfectly reasonable things to discuss, carbon dioxide removal, negative emission technologies, and, and increasingly even the language of geoengineering. But these things aren't material particularly the negative emissions and the geoengineering, they're not, they're not actually material things you can go out and get and buy at scale. They are at very best, very small pilot schemes that, you know, that capture a few thousand tonnes here and there. You know, but set against the fact is that we're emitting around about 36 to 37 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide every year from burning fossil fuels. These technologies are just capturing you know, just a few thousand tonnes. There's absolutely no way that you can scale these things up from just being, you know, very small pilot schemes, often with, with you know, a very checkered technical history, that you can scale these things up in a timeline that matches the carbon budgets that come out of the science that relate to 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade. And yet we evoke them as if somehow they are, they can be aligned. They cannot be aligned. In fact, they've undermined the narrative I would argue, for the last at least 10 to 15 years, if not 20 years. So the adoption of these sorts of technologies, and it's not they're not the only ones, they're not only these technologies that are, that are planned to remove our, our carbon dioxide, to suck the carbon dioxide, hundreds of billions of tonnes, you know, up to sort of half a trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and bury it securely underground in a timely manner, that the assumption of that has actually done the oil company's job for them. It has allowed us to postulate ongoing fossil fuel use to avoid major, profound political, um, social change. And I have made this point before. I think the, the big, what I've often referred to as integrated assessment models, whilst I think a lot of the modelers are, are good people doing as objective work as they can, the boundaries they work within are deeply subjective. And they have actually done you know, the job of Exxon for the last 20 years by undermining the narratives we've needed to have to start to address climate change. And I think that these have been so normalized now that when you talk about them and that they may not work as is assumed, you almost seem to be an extremist. So you're an extremist because you're pointing out that these technologies that barely exist are completely relied on the models. That seemed to be the extreme position rather than the extreme position being how on earth can it be that virtually every single model run that we have rely on these either technologies or some other use of what, you know, the awful term of nature-based solutions. 
yeah, but the language we use, it sort of captures something and makes it all sound so neat that we can simply put it into the accountancy spreadsheet that under, underpins these models. And hey, presto, we can evoke wonderful low carbon futures that occur almost overnight. It's And the journalists have allowed this to happen. A lot of the senior academics have allowed this to happen. And I think it comes back to them a point earlier that actually often as experts, we're very good at reductionist thinking, but we're not very good at systems thinking. Maybe wider civil society is much better at systems thinking than we are actually as experts. There's a telling point in the conversation, because when you're talking about this very thing, Johan does say that if you take, if you don't put the nets in the negative emissions technologies, it starts to look very scary. And I think that there was a sort of moment there is that, well, if they don't work, then surely we need to actually look at scary straight in the face. It's not as if they don't work. They cannot work in the timeline that we have. That just is not possible. You know, let's imagine that we can technically, technically we can make them work. You can't, you can't put them in place fast enough. And this is true for not just for the negative emission technologies. In the UK, we're obsessed at the moment with hydrogen, not with hydrogen because we're going to produce it from renewables. And that's a very small part of the UK's low carbon hydrogen strategy. I mean, the focus of, of hydrogen is that we can carry on burning fossil fuels. We can continue to use natural gas and we'll get the hydrogen out of the natural gas. And if you unpick all of that, it's still, it's firstly, it's, it's still very high carbon emissions um, hydrogen has a very high indirect global warming impact. If you're doing it for methane, you've got a lot of emissions from getting the methane out of the ground, the leakages and so forth. So that also still has a very high impact. Um, so there's a whole lot of, again, smoke and mirrors in the hydrogen debate, which are really just there to perpetuate the fossil fuel industry. So it's not just the negative emission technologies. It's lots of other technologies that are out there. And the point about all of these technologies is that they are necessary, or at least pseudo-technologies, because they're not actually there at the moment at scale. And let's be clear, <laughs> you know, as an engineer, I think one thing I can I can say with certainty is that taking something that's that's a very small pilot scheme and assuming you can scale it up to huge sort of global planetary level completely misunderstands what engineering does. There are a whole set of problems. You can't just multiply something up and assume that that is something you can simply do because you've, you've managed to do it in a laboratory or in a small test lab somewhere or a small facility. As you multiply things up, new engineering challenges arise. We don't know what they are until we, until we start to do it. So yes, let's try these things. But relying on them means that we haven't opened up the Pandora's box about social, political an equitable change. And that is what these things are there for. They are to maintain the current power structure. They're not there as real material things. They are there to maintain a particular political status quo. That has been phenomenally successful. And that's my concern that we in the climate realm, particularly those people who have developed these large models about what we need to do, have undermined the narrative for 20 years. So we haven't discussed what does this mean politically? What does it mean socially? What does it mean equitably within our own countries, let alone equitably across the world? Those questions aren't really asked because they don't need to be because we've evoked some technical response that's going to allow business as usual to carry on, but just with a, a green facade. So let's not pretend that the only obstacles we have to overcome are the oil majors and senior politicians that have no courage or spine. Actually, a lot of the expert community, I think, has also played into their terrain, has undermined the need for thinking more widely, more systemically about these challenges. But as we're going forward now, and other narratives, they are out there, the people are talking about degrowth and you know, ecological economics, all these sufficiency is something that uh, is a mm. word that crops up do you think that the, these will get traction or do you just think we just crash into impacts and then have a sort of meltdown? <laughs> Which is, you know, another well, narrative I mean, that's out there by people who are very worried about climate change. Yeah, yes, yeah. I mean, I, th I think if you're a betting person, you'd say the chance of them getting, getting genuine traction is very slim. But again, th th that chance is not just a random chance, that is chance that we we play into, that we can make, that we can construct. So if we don't start to, and when we, I mean, the wider society doesn't start to push these other narratives as well, then of course they will fail. The trick at the moment, I think we have to be really careful about this, is the power of the status quo of the, of the current elites, if you like, 
the real trick for them often is to is to give the impression that you take them on board and then you can stop them really developing and that's that's not a new technique that's something that the incumbent power has done throughout history so if we see working group three of the IPCC. Now, working group three, for those that aren't aware, that's the section that looks at these sort of futures. So it's not, if you like, it's not the science of climate change. It's not looking at the impacts and vulnerability. It's looking about what we can do about climate change. Or in my view, it's looking about how we can avoid doing anything significant about climate change. That's the principal goal of many, if not all of the senior people in, no, not all, many of the senior people in the IPCC. What they've done now is to allow a little discussion around sufficiency. As it, and that, that, to some extent, is dangerous because it almost looks as if they're allowing that now, they're, they're now thinking about those issues seriously. But of course, they're not. When you look for their, at their summary for policymakers, it's not there. So you allow some, some chapter on sufficiency or discussion of sufficiency to disappear into, into the thousands of pages that you actually produce that virtually no one gets to see and will make it nowhere near the debate that's been had by the summary for policymakers of those do documents, by the executive summaries. So let's be careful that the incumbent power structures, and I say these are people often that are cl quite close to us, not just the billionaires or the oil and gas executives. They are much more embedded in our system, I think, than we, we like to really acknowledge. The trick of that incumbent's power is to give the impression that they are taking notice of things like degrowth, of sufficiency of these other narratives. And by doing that, they almost thwart the development of those narratives. So we need to be very aware when these other narratives are being taken up by the existing powers, just don't assume that they are automatically doing it because they think they're worthwhile. They may be doing it because they think they want to close down to what to them is a dangerous set of narratives that, that raise questions about the current power structures, which they don't want to have raised. Yeah. But that's not to say that we shouldn't pursue these things. We should, and we should push them very hard. And actually, I think these narratives can be structured. And I think more than that, I think then they, they can be structured, but I think they also are often ones that that go very well with improving the well-being of the majority of citizens in our society. So it's not as if these narratives are bad for the majority. And I think this is a really important element that we've not really yet developed, that responding to climate change through these broader social and political narratives, as well as through technical change is actually better for many people in our societies, including within wealthy societies. And I don't just mean the poorest in our societies. Often actually the mode, the median, even the average, the mean, and, and the patronising language used by uh, policymakers in the UK, you know, the hardworking families, they always sort of pretend that they're concerned about, that most of those hardworking families will do much better with this sort of more social, political element of responding to climate change than they would do out of the status quo. There are many, and I'm reluctant to use this language because I can know lots of my colleagues will wince at it, but almost like win-win situations for large swathes of our society. But they are at the cost of the power and the material wealth of a relative few who drive the agenda and take most of the resources from our society. And it's interesting because we're struggling or you're struggling there to almost articulate it. And that comes back to what yeah. you're saying about journalists. They're not going to articulate it. Who owns the journalism? I mean, who owns that's, that's a yeah. Who who owns those? So there are good journalists out there, but they're often held back by the media barons, by their editors. So your know, good journalist pieces are often undermined simply by some of the sort of clickbait subtitles um, that are that are used. That's if they're allowed to put those those pieces into papers at all. And I hear this from journalists, some of the journalists that I engage with. I mean, they are quite damning of the elites in the journalistic process that, that stop good journalism occurring. But I think others are also very happy because they're, they're doing very well out of the system. And when you look at something that sets the narrative and in, in, at least sets some of the news agenda in the UK that comes out of, for instance, the BBC Radio 4 programme that I listen to almost every morning, the Today programme, when you have people that are paid a quarter to a third of a million pounds every year, plus all of the after dinner speaking and all the other things on top of that, you know, they're not going to be opening up these narratives about equity. So if you like, the news narrative is already thwarted by the types of people that we have that are setting the media agenda. In this regard, I think social media might be more helpful because it, it does allow a wider set of voices to be heard.
so I think the media takes a, an important role here, but then I think, I think academia does as well, is that we, we by and large, as I said before, we, we've been reluctant to open up that, that those issues around the sort of social and political changes that are necessary if we're to deliver on climate change. And as, as you said, the, sort of, the narrative could be quite easy to, to think about here, is that we have huge numbers of houses in the sixth richest countries in the world in the UK that mean fuel poverty. That means that the children living in those houses will be having as more asthmatic problems and bronchial problems, as well as their parents and, of course, grandparents as well, because of the fungal spores that live in the air in those houses that are very poorly heated, very poorly constructed, are very damp. That will affect those children's educational attainment. They probably live in the poorer parts of town. They have very busy roads where the wealthier people will be driving backwards and forwards in their larger cars, sometimes SUVs, making the, the air quality poorer. For these people, responding to climate change is good at every single level. They can live in more comfortable homes. They can afford their heating. Their children will have better education because the air quality is better. The roads outside will be much cleaner. At, at every level, you know, the public transport would have to be there to replace the use of cars if we're going to um, reduce our emissions. And so you know, the narrative for many people in our society about climate change is really so positive. But those of us who have disproportionately benefited from the from the productive capacity, from the, the labor and the resources in our society. We don't want that because that means we will have to forgo a lot of the wealth that we have become accustomed to. And who is that we? Well, it is people like me. It's the climate, you know, it's the climate senior climate scientists and people engaged in these issues. It is the senior journalists. It is the policymakers. It is the business CEOs and the and the managers. We so often normalize our lives and like to think ourselves as the average. And we are usually getting paid even the, you know, the you know, two, three, four times the average, if not far more than that. And so without the pressure from civil society, we cannot rely on people like me and the journalists to drive a more progressive narrative. Civil society is absolutely key in this. This partnership is absolutely key. And I think the more that civil society engages in these issues in its many ways, the greater scope that gives for other people, early career academics, other journalists, and other people to come out and be more honest from our expertise. So to avoid those cognitive dissonances, those dualities that I think are evident as I said in the in the interview with Johan, but indeed, I think many of us in the expert community actually have. It allows us to be able to speak more openly and more honestly. Do I think any of this will bring about the Velvet Revolution? The, the chances are slim, but if we don't push really hard in a very short time, time frame, then we are guaranteed to fail, not just on 1.5, but on 2 degrees centigrade. And that means we may be failing on, on much higher temperatures, and certainly the impacts then start to look absolutely dire as you play out all these tipping points that Johan Rockstrom, Tim Lenton, and many others have been been um, developing an understanding of from the science. Well, on that rather cheerful note, we can we can finish. But thank you very much. It's been really insightful. No, oh, thank you very much, Nick. It's always good to talk to you. I always feel a little bit depressed afterwards. Thank you for listening. A reminder that episodes appear weeks earlier for YouTube and Patreon members. This is due to my work schedule. However, support for the podcast enables this work to continue. Thank you.